the most famous maze of all probably never existed, and even if it did, would have been a doddle to solve, if depictions of it on Cretan coins are anything to go by. The architect Daedalus, the story goes, built a winding series of passageways called the Labyrinth for King Minos of Crete as a place to contain the Minotaur. This monstrosity with a bovine head, a human body, and an understandably bad temper was the offspring of Minos's wife and a white bull given to the king by Poseidon, god of the sea. As a punishment to the Athenians whom he defeated in battle, Minos demanded that a number of their young men and women be periodically sacrificed to the creature lurking at the labyrinth's heart. One year the hero Theseus of Athens took the place of one of the youths to be sacrificed, entered the dreaded system of chambers, unraveled a ball of thread given to him by Ariadne, Minos's daughter, as he went, slew the Minotaur, and then escaped by following the thread trail back to the entrance. We don't know how the labyrinth of Minos was laid out. In any case, it's just a legend, more bull than the actual product of human ingenuity. What we do have are coins from the island of Crete dating back to between 300 and 100 BC that bear designs presumed to represent the layout of the famous lair of the Minotaur. Most of these depict a rather simple yet ingenious pattern, typically in the form of a seven or eight level unicursal maze. The number of levels is how many times you cross the path to the center if you draw a line from the outside to the ultimate goal. Unicursal means there's only one way in and out. As for the distinction between maze and labyrinth, that's a matter of what definition you choose. Some languages have only one word for maze or labyrinth. The Spanish labyrinto, for instance, translates as either. Maze is Old English for confuse or confound, while labyrinth comes from the Greek labyrinthos, the etymology of which is controversial. Some scholars have linked the Greek term with the Old Lydian word labris for double-edged axe, a symbol of royal power. So the theory goes the labyrinth was part of the palace of the double axe, the home of the Minoan kings. It's a tentative and questionable link. In any event, we're left with a choice of definition and how, if at all, we want to distinguish between a labyrinth and a maze. Our purposes being mainly mathematical, we'll assume that a labyrinth is a special type of maze, a unicursal maze. A labyrinth, then, is just a winding passage with no choices of which way to go or leave, except back the way we came. A maze, on the other hand, we'll take to be the general case of a system of paths that may have multiple branches and a layout as confusing and convoluted as the maze designer cares to imagine. A maze may also have multiple entrances, exits and dead ends, whereas in the form of a labyrinth, although it may be ingeniously long to traverse given its total area, it consists of nothing more than an unbranching path, which leads to the centre and then back out the same way, with only one point of entry and exit. Labyrinths aren't so much an intellectual challenge as they are a place to spend time in an unusual environment. As such, they tend to have been employed as a form of meditation, a point nicely captured in the phrase you enter a maze to lose yourself and a labyrinth to find yourself. Not surprisingly, designs for labyrinths are found in places of spiritual reflection. A well-known one is set into the floor of the nave of Chartres Cathedral, the border made of blue-black marble and the path itself of 276 slabs of white limestone. With a diameter of just under 13 metres, it's large enough for a person to walk around the snaking track, as pilgrims have done since its construction sometime in the early 13th century. Rumour has it that there was once a depiction of the Minotaur at the centre of the 11 concentric rings of the pattern, but the primary symbolism, for obvious reasons, is Christian. The design features four arms standing for the branches of the cross, 
and a winding path intended to symbolize the road to Jerusalem. Those not able or willing to make an actual trek to the holy city could thus simulate the journey more conveniently by walking around this handy representation or for the genuinely pious shuffling around it on their knees. Although not the most ornate or embellished of labyrinths found in ecclesiastical buildings around the world, the one at Chartreuse is considered archetypal, and others like it are known as Chartreuse mazes. Many other labyrinthine patterns are to be found in other parts of the world from all periods of history from the Neolithic and Bronze Ages to recent times. As we've seen, they're intended not as puzzles to solve, but as devices for religious or spiritual practice, ritual or ceremony. It's thought that long ago, Nordic fishermen would walk labyrinths before heading out to sea as a way of ensuring a plentiful haul and safe return, and that in Germany young men did the same as a rite of passage to adulthood. But these motives for their creation and design don't detract from the mathematical interest of labyrinths. The ingenuity and variety of techniques used to pack such a long path into a comparatively small space are fascinating in themselves. There's the study too of all the different ways of producing unicursal paths from seeds, the starting shapes in the form of short sections of curves in a symmetrical pattern that determine the initial course of the path of the labyrinth from the centre working out. Labyrinths can be left or right-handed, depending on the direction of the first turn after entering, have different numbers of circuits, and take any of a couple of dozen or more distinct forms, largely determined by the choice of seeds, known to specialists in the subject. 